It's interesting. It's uh, evening here. Uh, I believe some of you uh, have just woken up and uh, it should be midday. Some uh, my guest is going to be more services prospect on I architecture. Uh, I know it's been uh, a cliche, but uh, for quite some time, quite some years. Uh, uh, but believe uh, me, it's not in the architecture talk. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I'm an iOS developer since uh, the beginning of iOS. That was back in 2008, I believe. Uh, working on uh, uh, SDK even before the official SDK was released. Uh, I worked a couple of uh, uh, books back in 2011 and 12. Uh, wrote parallel projects. And I've, uh, my main job uh, is uh, I've been helping uh, uh, in the past six, seven years, or so but these are uh, the, the talk is basically my experience in the last seven years on how uh, I've scaled teams on uh, uh, iOS development. Okay, now I want to clear the air around the whole architecture thing. Most of the time, when I talk about microservices and architecture, this that I get asked, really? We there are uh, already every, time, every single time using microservices and iOS. That's the question I uh, get asked. So let, let me clear the air on this. What this talk is not about? It, it it is about fancy architecture that we normally get. Uh, uh, we normally uh, rule around uh, like VM, MVP, or MVC, or whatever. It's not about that. It is not about how to break a project into like a thousand different frameworks, uh, taking inspiration from Facebook or Uber or Riblet or not. It's nothing to do with that. <laughs> what this talk is about instead is it's about being pragmatic. What uh, works for a small company is not work. But uh, for a team with like five to twenty people, which does not work with uh, work for a team that is bigger, like hundreds and hundreds of developers, right? The vast majority of the time, well, we see people uh, from a big company doing a talk about how they scaled up their uh, engineering infrastructure, and we tend to replicate that uh, uh, that uh, engineering patterns in our projects and get burned pretty badly, right? This talk is about that. This talk is about how to scale uh, companies where you work with five to twenty other developers, uh, making apps for a customer base of about you know a couple million uh, people. And of course, that's uh, a vast majority of us. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, it's about you know talk about a CSA founded startup uh, kind of company. So let's get started. Assuming most of us, uh, most of us in this crowd are, are with me. That's fine. Oh, uh, some more things that I want to say. This is everything you hear in this is about my personal experience. I worked for super big companies, super small startups. So uh, that's, that's the whole premise of the stock. Taking experience from the big company and bring it in the startup world and uh, help scale them. Right? The technical part of this uh, talk is about how to enable multiple teams to work and deploy a single shared code base uh, and ship it to their customers. Multiple teams working on one single repo. That's, that's the whole thing. Multiple teams working, deploying a single shared code base to the customers. Right. Uh, we're going to do more repo. Now, again, this is not the talk yet. Uh, we could do more repo. Again, that's not this. Now, why do you want to do microservices? In a traditional world, uh, let's not talk about this for a moment. Traditional world, we do microservices to improve uh, uh, continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, and to enable team independence. Every single team uh, want to iterate on their own pages independent of everyone else. And that becomes a little too tricky with iOS. 
Why? Because we have something called an Excel project file. Right? Scaling an Excel project is by one person to be used by a team or a handful of the developers becomes a lot difficult. Xcode isn't designed for that. And that involves sometimes bringing your project into multiple frameworks. And too many times what happens uh, is when you start thinking, uh, uh, bringing your project into multiple, you're still working in one single uh, workspace, one single Xcode workspace. And I've seen something like this happen all the time. Break projects into multiple classes, very deep net higher and end with a with something like a first increase edition. Uh, you don't want to create that. You don't want a monolith. You don't want a monolith broken into multiple classes and multiple uh, uh, subclasses and uh, uh, hierarchy. What you instead want. something is I'm coming to. Now, at the same time, you don't want to break things into very fine uh, individual module and create a kind of Ravioli code, right? So a Ravioli code is where uh, too many individual isolated bits and pieces of code uh, are trying to uh, 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 so talk to each other. When you look at code, code base, you'll be, uh, you'll be able to understand what each and every single class is doing. But trying to understand the whole perspective of how this particular code fits into the rest of the architecture becomes a lot uh, difficult to understand. And you don't want to end up with something like that either. Right? Okay, example I uh, uh, would uh, think of and say is uh, when you use a very nested framework, a uh, very nested uh, uh, architecture wipe you end up with a code that's very invalid and very difficult to understand. Right, and your app contact becomes too hard to follow. Now, where do you draw the line? You don't want to fix this first, you don't want to have your course. How do you draw the line? Where, where exactly do you draw the line to make sure that it's it is right and works for you? Now, there are two types of boundaries I want to talk about. Horizontal lines, so called as layers, layers here, code, and vertical lines, which are the team boundaries. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this talk today, right? Horizontal sources, classic stuff, uh, the model controller, model view, IVM, paper, model presenter, coordinators. There's so many, many ways in which you can uh, slice pure code, right? The M architecture and much, much more, right? We've, we've seen numerous architectures over the last three plus years. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how to slice the code locally. Uh, and that, means that, that that could be based either on screens or teams. And they are kind of, uh, uh, they kind of go hand in hand uh, with each other. And that is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. How do those vertical sizes go? Depends on how, uh, you want to structure your code. It's purely based on your team and what works for your team. Now, normally when uh, we do voting slicing, we create a, a kind of platform team and individual field teams uh, working on top of the platform team. Something a team would look something like this. A platform team uh, usually take care of building and deploying code. They take care of all common functionalities and objects. And feature teams take care of uh, delivering the individual features. Uh, right, this is how uh, some companies, I like believe Spotify and Facebook, they work similar to this. The platform team provides networking APIs, the common uh, shared libraries, other stuff. And feature team work on individual screens, like new feed or we play the screen or uh, the um, new movie play scheme, music Nice screen, whatever. Right. That has worked well for some companies, actually, like companies that are very, very big, like hundreds of developers. Um, what the problem with that kind of team is 
the platform team starts growing bigger and bigger and bigger and the boundaries between the platform and the feed team becomes very, very, very small. As a result, uh, there will be a time when, uh, when a couple of developers, one of the feed team leaves, the feed team gets involved into the, the platform team and things that happen. As a result, as one team gets super big compared to the other teams, innovation dies in the companies. We don't want something like that to happen for a company like two to 20 developers. So what did I, uh, what did we do? Like I, I've been uh, using something similar to this strategy for about five years now, and it has worked very well for me. Uh, if you look at this example, the feature team is significantly bigger than what it was before. This is the previous one. This is the new one, right? The, the our team is a lot smaller, and uh, there is a spread building point that usually owns the unit tests and takes care of the DevOps uh, uh, stuff, like the setting up the build pipeline, ensuring the app to submit uh, the correct version of the apps, built against the correct version of the uh, backends and deploy and all the stuff. Three teams have a lot more uh, say in how they are done. Now, What uh, is different here is the building of my team, the core team, not the same. And that changes a lot. That changes a whole lot of dynamics behind how uh, the entity communication work. Okay. I'll touch on this uh, in a short while. Uh, now, we often talk a lot about how to create a team to improve productivity, but uh, a vast majority of talks and blog posts and most of that I've seen uh, do not talk about where exactly your code ship lies and how to act exactly put the uh, code and uh, stuff like that. We conveniently avoid talking. We just say, hey, this feature should be on by that team, this feature should be on by that team. The rest of the uh, talk today is going to be how do you exactly slice them up so that uh, you end up with uh, less overlaps, right? Now, types and plays are important in how uh, easy or how difficult it is to break up uh, uh, monolith. Uh, we work predominantly in, in our programming world, in the software world, we have two major system, a uh, strong type uh, language like Swift and Kotlin, or a uh, weekly type or language like JavaScript. In a weekly type system, it's fairly uh, relatively straightforward. When it's fairly straightforward, it would be relatively straightforward to uh, identify your core boundaries and deploy it independently. Uh, but Swift or Kotlin is not weekly type, right? Uh, in a weekly type system, you just copy files, move move them around, uh, move your files around, uh, and kind of deploy it. In a strong type system, not so easy, right? The biggest hurdle when you uh, size uh, iOS code into screens is you have to ensure that your slice compiles. And this is probably the most important reason why most teams don't even bother. Like I'll give you an example. Let's say you have an app uh, which is a, a, a tab bar controller. Uh, let's assume for uh, for a moment that let, let, let's think of an app that everyone uses, App Store. Right? It has four tabs, uh, a, a for you screen, a list of apps, a list of games, and a search. Right? If you have to split this into four different uh, uh, slices, with each tab being owned and deployed and developed by independent teams, how would you do that? That is exactly what I'm you know. Uh, explain. I, I I did it for a very similar project uh, because of NDAs and other reasons. I can't uh, explain much more about it. But for this of this presentation, I'm going to use App Store. Okay. Uh, how are we going to solve this problem? It turns out that we have solved this problem before, and that's called as package managers. Okay. Now. How could package managers uh, help us? We've done this on open source projects. 
And uh, I thought like six years ago, I thought, why should open source projects have all the fun? Like, why, why can't we build uh, our code internally as we develop open source projects? Let's say uh, you see that cool looking uh, uh, alert box component, UI uh, alert controller or whatever. What will you do? You just say, if, if, it, if they publish a Cocoa pod, you say pod, uh, the, you add that pod to your pod file, do a pod update, and within your code, you just say import uh, alert controller, whatever, uh, and then lock in it, present uh, view controller, and that's it, right? That independent uh, open source code can be written in any language. It could be in Objective-C and your code could be in Swift and it still works. Why can't we do that in our own project? There is nothing stopping us from doing that, doing exactly that. So, so far we have been breaking code uh, into classes and frameworks, right? Take it to the next level, create a package uh, for your framework, for your individual framework, it could be anything. You could you could use Swift Package Manager, you could use Carthage, you could use Cocoa Pods. Try delivering every vertical slice as one package. The biggest advantage of this is when you move your code around and create a framework, the compiler is here to help you. The compiler will ensure that uh, uh, you are able to compile the framework. Uh, but again, don't overdo this. If you overdo it, you'll end up with ravioli code with multiple pods and no one understands what's going on uh, or so. Okay. A thumb rule is you should have as many number of packages as the teams uh, that want to work on that single uh, code base. If you have like four teams working on it, try to create four packages or pods. Now putting it all together, create a package for every single feature that uh, you're building. The application uh, is usually owned by the builder deploy team, the, uh, the one you see in green at the top, uh, is usually very, very lightweight and integrates all the packages into a deployable binary. For example, let's say feature one uh, belongs to feature, uh, feature one uh, is the first tab and there are five tabs in this, for four tabs and maybe one other login screen or something. The build and deploy team uh, just assembles all them together, prepares all the all the uh, necessary dependencies, injects them, and this uh, and sets it at the as the root window. That's it. They, usually, the build and deploy team's app itself will be like less than two hundred lines of code. It's not something that you will maintain often. Simple, mm, not really. Some modules are independent. Most are not, and that's where the problems come in. And I'm going to explain some of the problems that I've faced in the past and solutions that uh, we have come up with. Okay, now you saw that core team at the bottom, right? Some of these features are delivered by the core team, like for example, a networking component that we used by all those feature uh, teams. And sometimes it would be UI as well, like for example, uh, you could have a, a simple UI component that is being used in the first screen and the third screen and the fifth screen and so on. Uh, and this common code can be adopted at different pace by different teams because uh, again, team dynamics come in uh, to picture. Uh, different teams have different uh, team strengths and uh, you should have, uh, you should love some slack uh, at which they adopt the code. Uh, and you don't want code to be duplicated across code boundaries. Uh, so let's see a more concrete example. I, I, I told you before that I'm going to uh, use App Store as an example because uh, my, my experience comes from, uh, I have an e-commerce background, uh, been building e-commerce app for almost six, seven years. Uh, so the app that I built uh, from where I took all this inspiration uh, was from uh, e-commerce app, very, very similar to App Store. But what is the best e-commerce app ever made? It's the App Store, right? We, Apple uh, makes almost $17 billion using this app. Probably the best app to take any kind of uh, inspiration when building an e-commerce app, right? So this app has like five tabs. I'm just going to focus on one uh, for the sake of simplicity. Uh, it has a login, which you don't see it here. Uh, but you see that uh, picture on the top right, uh, 
with my picture. That is where login happens. You tap on it. If you, if you don't, if you're not logged in, you will not see anything there. You'll probably see an empty face or a place on the image. You tap on it and it shows the login. That login is, think of login as an individual slice. Uh, explore uh, could be uh, the list of products that you see right now on that screen. Search could be another product list, but might be displayed in a different style. Uh, a product detail screen where you know you tap on one of the items and you see a detail screen. And a checkout flow. Of course, App Store does not have a checkout flow. You tap on it, you pay using a uh, using uh, the built-in credit card, approve it through your face ID or touch ID or whatever. But in a normal checkout scenario, you'll probably have multiple payment uh, mechanisms. Uh, optionally, a delivery time, delivery schedule, or a, a delivery address, uh, and a confirmation page or something. And then once delivery is done, you'll probably be uh, showing something to rate uh, how the delivery was done, blah, 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 all this stuff. So checkout might be simple for App Store, but in real world scenario, in a more uh, sophisticated e-commerce, it might be a little more complex. So usually you will have like five teams, if, if it's a uh, company that uh, has about 20 employees, four of them working in each. Uh, team, something like that, right? Now, that one that is highlighted is one app, right? It's, uh, uh, I'm going to call it as an app header component, right? And this one single uh, app that is displayed on a table view cell or a collection view cell is, uh, could be, you could call it as an app cell component. Now, this app header component and, uh, uh, sorry, this app cell component and app header component would probably be reused on, across all different uh, screens. So it's a good idea to move it to the uh, core team and make it their responsibility to, to deliver these components. Now, how will we integrate it? We'll look into it in a short while. So go back to our packages. Uh, we have five of them. Login, probably most easy and most independent of all the components. They probably won't have any of the shared models except for that one single uh, picture of the user. Checkout, again, going to be simple. The complexity in checkout is going to be uh, integrating all those payment gateways and other stuff, but it, 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 it doesn't involve or uh, much about what is going on within the app. It probably doesn't share a lot of code with the remaining uh, things. But the other three, explore, search, and product details will probably have a lot of shared functionalities. Right. And that's where the fun uh, begins. Now, the core team provides components like app cell, app header, build and deploy team owns the unit tests, integrates everything, and runs the unit tests before deploying. Individual teams, publishes, and uh, sends the package uh, to the app store. To the, uh, app store. Now, In one of my uh, uh, work, one of this team was even a cross-platform team and it worked beautifully, why? Because hypothetically speaking, let's say if your checkout flow is completely done uh, using React Native or some web-based uh, team so that uh, every platform uses the same uh, checkout flow, you can still work because at the end, to, to your application that you're deploying to App Store, login is a package, it's a pod. Explore is another pod. So it's a pod, product details is a pod, and checkout is going to be a pod. When you think from this app's perspective, the other pods can be written in any language. It could be written in Reactive, it could be written in uh, Objective-C, Swift, Swift UI, whatever. At the end, when you call, you're going to use just the binary framework. And that is where uh, the magic is. When one of the teams was on cross-platform, it did not slow the compilation for everyone else. How often have we faced a scenario where one team wanted to use React Native and everyone else were like, oh, no, let's not do that. But with this kind of a, a uh, finely broken architect, finely sliced architect, that is still possible. I'm not saying you should do it, but you know, keep your options open. Uh, I was talking about shared uh, components and uh, 
uh, shared components like the app cell and app, app header that will be used across multiple screens. Right? Let's see how uh, we can adopt some versioning strategies to uh, make sure that uh, when different teams uh, handle integration at different pace, you could still work. Like for example, I could have an app cell today. I could update the app cell to app cell version two tomorrow, uh, but app cell two will be used only on the third screen and app cell one will be used on the explore screen because explore screen had a couple of iOS developers going on Lee or something like that. It's still possible. Again, this is a problem that we have solved before and the best way to do it is to use component versioning. I'll talk about component versioning in a short while. Uh, on the client side, feature flags can help a lot. You can develop uh, or integrate a new component completely behind a feature flag uh, and turn it on when everyone is happy and ready. Right? Component versioning, uh, let's say you have an app header, uh, uh, that is called as com my company, my app components app header 1.0 and two types of app set. The core team's responsibility is to maintain both the versions of uh, app cell as uh, ongoing. Uh, has, they have to support it uh, till everyone has moved on to the second uh, version of the component. Uh, when you do this, when you do, when you maintain two versions uh, simultaneously, uh, it gives a lot of flexibility to the feature teams to let them adopt uh, those components at their own pace. And we normally use this style, a uh, uh, reverse uh, domain name uh, system to uh, name those components. So it's easy. It's, it again comes from how REST API has been versioning their components thus far. Uh, so people usually who have uh, backend experience will find this versioning very, very similar. Uh, it's also a good idea to add a deprecation warning. Uh, so people who are working the feature teams know that, hey, there's a new version of this component when they compile the app. So they can start using that. Uh, very, very similar to REST API versioning. Uh, now, by providing multiple versions, you are actually giving times for the feature team to adopt your new component, which is a good thing, right? Now, it's not all rosy. There are still some pitfalls. Uh, and most of the pitfalls can be, uh, a vast majority of them uh, can be solved by uh, um, making multiple versions of the same component and using feature flags to hide uh, uh, partially developed uh, features into the working software. Uh, but make sure that the number of feature flags uh, you use are minimum okay, and make sure that you don't have 200 different components or else no one who's working on the core team will know which component is latest and so on. So uh, yeah. Now, there are a little more uh, issues that could come up. Uh, integration issues mainly because uh, the DevOps team or the integration team uh, who usually integrates everything together uh, might sometimes miss on something uh, and this could be caught only at the last moment because every feature team is working on their own example app that integrates just their own screen. So it's better to you know continuously integrate and see how your app looks uh, probably once or twice more, once or more than uh, twice a week at least. Uh, and the other pitfall that we often face is UI tests uh, failing you know, when, when a UI test failure is only caught in the integration stage because feature teams don't write or maintain UI tests, they only write and run unit tests. Uh, but again, uh, a good CI and uh, unit testing infrastructure could solve some of these problems. Uh, you don't have to do anything fancy with, uh, you know, custom repositories and custom project files, custom uh, uh, scripts and tons of stuff. But at the end, uh, do what for your team. And that's it, that's the end of my talk. Thanks everyone. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I'll be posting these slides uh, online so you can click on that link. Otherwise it's uh, 
uh, at Mugant Kumar, my name.